uh, Ramsey County Schools, universities, and the public in general. And I've been partnering with St. Paul Public Schools for well over 10 years. Uh, the purpose of this online forum is to have Superintendent Gothard and members of the St. Paul Public Schools leadership team answer questions for you, uh, uh, the, the families of our secondary students. Um, the team is ready to answer any questions about the return to school for secondary students on April 14th, um, and all questions are welcome. Uh, St. Paul Public Schools families are invited to post their questions uh, in the chat. I would ask that you keep your questions to the topic at hand. The time we have tonight will be best used if you all ask questions that can be answered by the leaders that are uh, currently joining us. Um, just a note for folks, uh, we have Hmong, Spanish, Korean, and Somali viewers. Um, and so we do have a multilingual uh, language version of this forum, and it's going to be available online at uh, spps.org as soon as possible. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Gothard to introduce the members of his team that are here to answer uh, the questions for you all tonight. Good evening, St. Paul Public Schools community. I'm Superintendent Joe Gothard and, and very grateful that you're taking time to, to spend with us tonight to have our team answer the questions that you have about our safe return uh, to secondary in-person learning beginning April 14th. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the rest of, or have the rest of my team introduce themselves and we'll begin with uh, Cedric Baker. Hi everyone, my name is Cedric Baker and I'm the Chief of Staff here at St. Paul Public Schools. Thanks for joining us. Hello everyone, my name is Dave Watkins and I am uh, Chief of Schools. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Josh uh, Delich, and I'm one of the assistant superintendents, and thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Dowd, and I'm the assistant superintendent of special aid services. Hello, I'm Han Saad, executive director of the Office of Digital and Alternative Education. Good evening, my name is Craig Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the Office of Teaching and Learning. Good evening. I'm Mary Langworthy. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness. Good evening. My name is Kathy Kimani and I work as the Director of the Office of School Support. Good evening. My name is Tom Parent and I'm the Director of Facilities for St. Paul Public Schools. Good evening. I'm uh, Tom Burr, Director of Transportation for St. Paul Public Schools. Hello, I'm Darren Ginther, Director of the Office of College and Career Readiness. Hello, I'm Stacey Kelpin, Director of Nutrition Services. Hello, I'm Tim Brown, Principal at the American Indian Magnet School, representing K-8 schools tonight. And good evening, I'm Teresa Vibar, Principal at Ramsey Middle School. Happy to be part of this discussion. All right. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Gothard, um, as well as all the other uh, members of the leadership uh, who are here this evening. So um, as I mentioned before, um, I'm the moderator for tonight. My job as a moderator is to keep the questions and answers on the topic, um, ensure that responses are brief um, to the point, and make sure that our questions are actually getting answered. Uh, and with that, I will start us off with the first question uh, of the night. Uh, and that question is, why are secondary students only coming back for four and a half hours a day, four days a week? That is a very good question, and I look very excited to answer this question again. Josh Delich, one of the assistant superintendents uh, in the work of secondary. Um, districts throughout Minnesota, as many of you are aware, were charged with providing opportunities for in-person learning. Uh, we were provided opportunities of autonomy also to determine what in-person would look like for our school district and how it would best support our needs of our students. Um, and in doing so, our model of uh, the four days allows for the continuity of being with the same teacher, keeping the same schedule of classes, the continuity of being in with the same school, and the ever so important continuity of those relationships that we've developed with our teachers and our students and our staff. Um, in addition to that, um, the schedule um, also allows for us to have intentional opportunities to also connect to our students and families who may have opted for virtual learning. Many of you have heard other districts in which it, it caused a lot of um, chaos and changes where, with kids and staff and, and students being changed. Here with our schedule, we are allowing our opportunity to keep that teacher, keep that schedule, keep that site and give that continuity 
for our students. Um, in, in terms of the planning, also we know that it allows with our schedule, it gives us the planning and the time for us to deliver high quality instruction to our secondary students while also giving additional uh, support to our virtual learners as well. Um, and lastly, uh, we truly believe it is uh, you know, very important um, to, to do a design that is going to be the least disruptive to students, to our teachers and the relations that have been developed all year long and maintain that continuity of learning um, that we feel is in the best interest of our students in secondary for the remainder of the school year. All right, thank you. So the next question, do I need to sign up for virtual learning if I already signed up in the fall or if I opted out of in-person support? Yeah, thank you for the, the question. The request is right now that we have our secondary families make their request for virtual learning by this Thursday, March 11th. Whether you had signed up for uh, virtual learning in the past or to opt out of in-person is uh, not of material right now. We want you to choose uh, actively right now to uh, participate in virtual learning for the remainder of the year by March 11th. So we are asking folks who have families who have previously submitted to submit now, given the current conditions and the current uh, rationale for coming back to in-person by March 11th. You can visit apply.spps.org to click on a link to fill out a form to select virtual learning, or if you need to, the phone numbers are available on the apply.spps.org website and the multilingual phone numbers are also available for families. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Why are school start times changing for the secondary in-person model? All right, uh, Josh Delich, and Susan Superintendent here. Um, as many of you are aware, um, we have our in-person elementary uh, learning opportunities that are happening. We also have our on-site uh, learning that is going on and as we move into this secondary transition of uh, in person which we're very excited about uh, one of the things that we wanted to ensure is that we are able to support our transportation demands uh, and also ensure obviously the safety of, of all kids and all of those that are being transported and by adjusting our start times it allows us uh, for our in-person secondary learning to continue to keep that continuity um, of what I mentioned earlier. Um, and this schedule also allows us um, to stagger routes in a way that will allow us to sustain the routes and the programs uh, that we currently have going on throughout uh, the remainder of this school year. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Christina Erickson. Will virtual students be able to keep their current teachers and classes? All righty, uh, that is again, I'm coming back. Well, yeah, hopefully you're enjoying listening to me, but um, what I can share with you is yes. Um, the design that I shared earlier is our intent is to keep that continuity and those relationships that our virtual learners have established um, with those teachers and throughout uh, our also our schedule design, the way it's set up, that there's opportunities in which they would even be able to uh, experience uh, the relationships with the kids that they've developed virtually. So we're very excited about that. Excellent question. All right, next from a Vanita Brandby. Will there be rotating shifts of students so classes and hallways aren't overcrowded? For example, will seniors go on certain days, freshmen on others? Alrighty, so one of the uh, items that I'd share with you again would be um, we are we had a analysis done through our buildings regarding um, looking at what it looks like in schools from hallways, uh, passing periods, um, common area places, and throughout the course of a school year and prior to, there's also signage, which I'm sure you've seen arrows down there directing students um, and addressing uh, where the flow of traffic will be to make sure that we are maintaining uh, the appropriate distance and making sure that students are, are not uh, loitering in areas that they need to. I also would like to call on just kind of one of our principals here on the call that could also talk about how they are approaching uh, working with 
um, what the question you've asked regarding um, just the, the rotating of students and how they've set that up. And I see Dr. Brown, you're up there, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We uh, just today met as a team with middle school and one scenario we're playing with, we're not sure how this will work exactly yet, but one scenario was simply um, what would happen if we doubled our passing time and released half of the students, you know, at first they got settled, released the second half. So there's, we're trying to play with that right now, just so there's not the crush in the halls for passing. Um, so that's one scenario we're trying to work through. Thank you. Next question from Shana Horn. How will you ensure that distant, uh, distant learning will offer equitable learning for students? Not all students can choose to go in person because of, <clears throat> because of a medical condition that makes them vulnerable to COVID. How can you ensure that students, especially high schoolers, will have a high quality of learning when there will be no guaranteed teacher contact in a synchronous format? Good evening, uh, Craig Anderson from the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, we're asking teachers to provide one lesson per day for all their classes, and that lesson will be in uh, the Schoology format. And so students in class and at home will have access to the same lesson. Now, synchronous opportunities uh, will be available every day for um, students in, in the virtual learning um, mode and that's part of why we're at the four and a half hours of in person and then a couple hours of uh, time where the teacher can connect either in small groups or with office hours for um, the students who are at home and so we're trying to balance the in person and at home and provide the same opportunity to have the same lesson um, that is created and built for Schoology. Part of Friday is the teacher has time to build those lessons and have videos available for the kids who are at home and for students who uh, may miss a day of class or be quarantined for some for COVID. And so it's kind of a, a system that's going to work um, for all students, regardless of if they're in school or at home. All right, next question from uh, Valerie Trimillet. How much of the in-person class time for the remainder of the year will be used for MCAs and standardized testing? That's a very good question. I also uh, send that over to uh, Mr. Anderson, but one of the things that I would offer from a school standpoint is we're going to look at every opportunity to try to support obviously the standardized testing, but also balance how do we continue with uh, the high quality of instruction that we want with in person. Um, so that of course is going to be a balance that we will work through as we get more guidance on standardized testing and MCAs. Uh, but also reiterating that we want to continue with that with that instruction and the in-person learning for our students. And with that, Mr. Anderson. Um, yeah, and the, the answer I have right now is I don't know. Um, the uh, U.S. Department of Education has given guidance to the states, uh, and that guidance is in the form of um, the ability to um, ask for waivers to modify the schedule for the Minnesota um, comprehensive assessments and depending on what the state of Minnesota chooses to do and if they uh, choose to ask for those waivers we'll have um, a different testing timeline. Currently we're planning for uh, the regular MCAs being taken in the, the spring as we always do and that amount of time would be the same as always if if the Minnesota Department of Education um, asks for a waiver and is granted that waiver from USDE there may be a change. <clears throat> All right next question is actually a question from Facebook from uh, an Amanda Paso. Well, will they do all classes in school or just some? Yes, that is uh, a great question, uh, Amanda. Yes, we are uh, aimed to make sure that we have all of the classes that a student would uh, have signed up for in the current classes that they have and offering those. However, you may see a variation based upon what the school sets up in terms of if they will do all of the courses throughout a given day or if they may block them based upon their schedule. But at the end, they will make sure that every course that a child signed up is 
that they would receive uh, those classes through the course of the week. And with that, I'm going to also call on um, Principal Vibar if you want to just kind of give an example of how you guys are approaching uh, schedules for students. Happy to share our schedule. Um, we're very fortunate that our current distance learning and on-site support schedules are going to drop into our in-person. So that transition for students is very minimal. We have an AA day and a BB day. So A, the first A day is periods one through three and the B, second A day is periods four through seven. Uh, and then B day happens similarly. So students will have four uh, opportunities to connect with classmates and teachers while on in person. All right, next question from Joanne Clark. How are you communicating with parents? Yeah, Ms. Uh, Clark, appreciate the, the question. Uh, one of the things I'd share is we've been really partnering and a big shout out to our communications on the messaging, whether it's our website, social media, um, emails, robocalls. We also have our sites, which I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Brown share about ways in which they're approaching communicating with parents, the specifics about wh what it's gonna look like for their sites. Uh, in addition to uh, the call outs, we also have the site messaging that will be occurring with you. Um, and then uh, doing a, a forum such as this to try to get the initial understanding. And then we also have our sites that are currently in the process of giving uh, site overviews to their community, which will also be following up with more specifics about what does in-person mean at our specific site. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brown to just talk about uh, what they're doing over there at his site. Thank you. What um, lately I fear that some of our uh, Families may be getting uh, email fatigue and not sure to cut through the clutter of what to really read and pay attention to. I can say that as a parent myself with some students in the secondary in a different district. So what I've learned to do the last uh, a few weeks here as a principal, I'm just doing kind of my own YouTube clip, very short, maybe 60 to 90 seconds, boiling everything down as best I can to some very specific talking points of what uh, what is happening uh, for this latest iteration here at Ames. And then I'm sending that out um, Blackboard through email to my families. Uh, but still before that, my family liaison is, is uh, crafting messages and we're emailing and texting families as well. But I found to cut through the clutter to get to the bottom line, I'm doing a quick YouTube video of myself just to have a talking head uh, kind of clarify right now through the clutter. Allow me to ask a follow up. Uh, can you uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more on like uh, maybe the frequency of communication and also if there's any uh, any, you know, certain things that you all are actually emphasizing in that communication? Yeah, it's been uh, every few weeks right now. It'll probably ramp up here as we go to the 14th of April, maybe even weekly. And right now the emphasis has been on families about um, making sure that they uh, get uh, their numbers in by the or their requests in by the 11th um, right now. Right now it's kind of the timeline. As we get closer to um, the end of the month, it'll be more about the specifics of what the school will look like and the programming. Thank you. Uh, next question from a Scott Mickelrath. For students that remain virtual, what would the differences be and how different will it be? So really compared to how if they've been virtual the entire time, it should not change too much. Some of the scheduling around when the synchronous times are, when the office hours are for the teacher and um, those those um, details of the school week may change just based on the fact that um, we're going to have students in person. However, the standards are the same and the teachers will be teaching the full coursework uh, using Schoology for all of their students and creating one lesson for students who are at home and students who are in, in person. And so that one lesson will be the same and they will have um, opportunities to interact with their teacher. Um, however, the times may change a little bit. All right. Next question from, uh, I believe it's Leah Greenside. How is it equitable to provide in-person students with four hours of instruction per day, but no live instruction for students in virtual learning? 
Yeah, so appreciate the question. You know, one of the things that I'd share with our uh, design is we have uh, developed a schedule in which teachers will have opportunities to connect each day with students that have uh, opted for virtual learning. They, of course, will be determined on how the site will work that if they're going to conjoin classes so that they would be able to support the students on a Monday. And then if it was another group on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Also, we have our Fridays that are, are given opportunities for our virtual learning. And so with this uh, uh, instructional design that we do have here, it allows for virtual learnings to get connected to courses uh, each week or have opportunities. And then also I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Anderson to uh, provide additional information as well. And uh, what I would add to that, um, Dr. Delich, is that the, the synchronous times are, um, are we're asking folks to have daily synchronous uh, interaction with their students and that may or may not happen during the day in that um, teachers can go above and beyond what is basically required of um, them for synchronous time and so I've heard stories of schools where there are teachers who open up um, uh, a Google Meet for students to ask questions at any time or they have, um, they'll have small groups where there are students um, getting together more frequently uh, to discuss the information and the topics. And so um, I see uh, Principal Bibar popping up too. If, if, if there's something that she'd like to add from the field, I think that's um, appropriate. Uh, my Ramsey Middle School teachers were concerned about um, scheduling the office hours. Uh, we had looked at a schedule where everybody would have the same office hours so it would be consistent for students and families to recognize that's when they should be connecting. However, an hour to maybe touch base with two or three teachers isn't enough. So my grade level teams are working to uh, extend that virtual learning office hours to be the whole end of the day from 1.30 to 3 so that students have more time to try to connect with more teachers if the need arise. And teachers are, are going to be sitting in their Google Meets waiting for students to jump in and, and collaborate with other peers in that space. Thank you. Next question from Janelle Bates, I think that's how you pronounce it. How, when, how, or when will parents be notified of positive cases in their schools? With secondary students coming into a lot more uh, coming into a lot more people in general than elementary students are, as they change classrooms much more often and do not stay with the same group of students in general. Great question, thank you, Janelle. Um, so we have our COVID reporting system that we utilize to um, learn of positive cases that are in our student and employee population. Um, when we learn of that positive case, we do work really closely with the administrator at that site to help determine um, where that person was, what their schedule was, who may have had close contact with that employee or student. Um, and then we do from there notify our families or employees who've been identified as a close contact to someone um, that tested positive and send that information out. We do work closely with the communications office um, to do translated messages for all of our families as well um, so that we have that communication going out in their home language. Um, we do not report every positive case. We do look to see when that person was on site and if there was an infectious period where they had contact with someone um, and then send those notifications out. But if a student was already in quarantine um, or maybe was not on site during spring break or a long weekend, um, we look at that infectious period to determine if notifications are needed. All right, thank you. Uh, Question from Shauna Horn. If students wait to decide to go online for learning now for more specific information to come out in the coming week or two, will they be guaranteed a spot at their current school and classrooms if they switch to online learning after the March 11th deadline? Or like the elementary students, will they be placed in a new school if the decision is not made by tomorrow? Shauna, thank you for the question. Uh, if in, in the case of secondary, the way it's set up is we want families to choose by March 11th so that uh, we're able to make a proper preparations for students who are coming and making sure room assignments for class sizes are, are uh, within our safe learning plan uh, parameters. 
if students choose to come in person and want to switch to virtual learning after the March 11th, that will be accommodated and they will not have to have their schedules disrupted. That's one uh, key design element of the secondary model is the students won't have to change their schedule. They will move from the in-person model to virtual learning. Uh, and that is a, a one-way pa uh, path. We do not have the option for students to move from virtual learning into in-person into the secondary model. And again, that has to do with some of the complexities of making sure that room assignments for the class sizes going back are appropriate for our safe learning plan. Next question from <clears throat> Abby Pinto. What lessons learned from virtual instruction will influence the use of in-person class time when students return to the building? So we have learned a ton of information um, being virtual and then being in person, especially with the, the different levels of students. And um, we really have learned that relying on our um, student information system or the, the Schoology um, platform is the best way to get the most consistent information to students. They all have access through their iPads and they've been using these iPads for years. We haven't always had consistency with what classes and courses look like. And so we've we've developed consistent courses to match um, what's necessary to go through a, a school day in an asynchronous way or, a, or a any time kind of a way. And so that students can still get all the information of school from their teacher and teachers can still follow up with students, um, but it's organized differently than we're, when we're face to face. Blended learning tells us that we have more opportunities for um, <clears throat> engagement with, with individual students and small groups of students when they do come on site. And so while it'll be the same lesson and the same instruction for at home and on site, teachers will have additional opportunities um, when, when they are with the students to you know, read their body language and understand the, the different things that happen when, when you're face to face. Um, uh, blended learning allows for the, for the best of each and we're hoping for and striving for the best of each during this pandemic. Next question from <clears throat> Michelle Hansen. Will students have five days a week in person by the fall as an option? Thank you so much, Michelle, for asking uh, this question. I was just asked this about an hour ago in, a, in an interview, what the fall will look like. And I, I think just for a minute, if I could go uh, History Channel uh, just for a moment. You know, last March 15th, 2020, we received Executive Order 2002 on a Sunday from Governor Walls uh, that essentially shut all Minnesota schools with a planning period in between. On July 30th, we received Executive Order 2082, and that was the safe learning plan. So it laid the framework for uh, what our different iterations of reopening uh, were for St. Paul Public Schools and all schools and school districts in Minnesota. I think right now I would have to say that we are going to have to wait for continued guidance from the departments of health and education uh, and from the state. We are still obviously experiencing COVID-19 as a community. I'm very happy to say that uh, our cases in Ramsey County have, have declined steadily and, and seem to be uh, going in a, in a very good way. We're the lowest, at least in terms of how uh, school districts uh, uh, chart the, the data for uh, cases per 10,000. Ramsey County uh, has the lowest uh, number of the metro counties and hopefully that can continue. And um, I, I think my goal uh, in the way that we're working together right now, obviously to, to bring back our students pre-K through 12 to be in person um, is our way to demonstrate that we can do this safely, we can do this well, and uh, we have every hope that we can open up in the fall and have five days a week being an option. There's a lot that will have to take place in between there. We haven't even talked about vaccines for uh, for people under under the age of 18. Um, and you know, hopefully throughout the summer, we can continue to uh, have our communities be vaccinated and begin to think about our, our school age um, young adults. <clears throat> I'd also like to say that I think that that's a question that um, 
more aptly could be be answered by saying that that's that's a question that everybody has a hand in working together and partnering with uh, and giving an answer. Uh, and the reason for that is because it, it, it depends on how well our, our school systems are in place, but also how well that our community members are following rules and recommendations um, outside of, uh, you know, in their homes and outside in their own communities. As, we, as we've seen lately, uh, the Minnesota uh, Department of Health just released, uh, had a press release last week about a, a particular county uh, uh, here in Minnesota that had a 62% increase in COVID, um, uh, uh, you know, in one of the variants. And as a result, that particular county has had to, for a couple of weeks, shut down club sports, school athletics, um, uh, and, and, and gyms and stuff like that. So this is truly uh, a situation where we really have to be collaborative and making sure that if we want to go back to uh, five days of uh, five days of in-person learning, that that has to be something that we all collaborate to to make that happen. Next question uh, from Ms. Janelle Bates once more. Is there a sense that all or most teachers will have been vaccinated by the April 14th date? Would you like me to jump in, Dr. Gothard? <laughs> maybe, yeah, why don't you start, Mary, and I'll see if I can maybe pick up some things at the end as well. Sure, that sounds great. Um, so we've had two paths. One is from the state plan to receive vaccination, um, and that has certainly ramped up a lot more recently with a lot more opportunities for our staff to get vaccinated, lots more local clinics. Um, but in addition, um, one of our partners here, William Moore um, and his team, we've been able to have a larger allotment from Ramsey County where we can also work locally to um, address those that staff that remained that have not been vaccinated. Our best estimate is probably 70 to 80 percent of our staff are vaccinated for those that are interested in getting it. Um, even this week, we have another opportunity for our, our staff to receive the vaccine this coming Saturday. We have an allotment of 600 vaccine um, for the second dose to happen again in April. Um, but we'll have regular allotments every week now moving forward, which is a great opportunity for in the coming weeks to really finalize anyone that is choosing to get vaccinated um, pretty quickly here. But we're, we're in a good spot compared with where we were a month ago for sure. You know, the only thing I'll add, thank you so much, Mary, is that if if you know of anyone, our families or are part of the district um, who is struggling, who hasn't had that opportunity, please have them get a hold of, have them get a hold of myself, Mary Langworthy. Um, there are state vaccine um, emails and, and resources that, that people have. We are here to help uh, make sure that we can provide an opportunity for vaccines for all of our staff. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Gabriela Cervantes. How can you guarantee that students will have the same teachers in virtual learning if those teachers will be in school teaching in person? The impression we've been getting from my son's high school is that they will only have one hour to meet with their teachers. Yes, Gabriel, uh, thank you for that question. Um, one of the things that I'd share with you uh, with the uh, the instructional in-person design that we uh, are using here in St. Paul, it allows us, as mentioned earlier, to keep that continuity with the teacher. So uh, your child would be able to have the same uh, teacher. And the way we set up our schedule is that our teachers that would be working in person with, with students would be working in person. And the way the schedule is set up for that modified at time of the day allows our teachers to then go back into the virtual uh, learning and be able to support our students in, in their uh, learning. In addition to that, I think we might have a couple of our principals, uh, Principal Vibar or Dr. Brown, if you want to share anything on how you guys have been approaching this and working with your sites. Um, we are encouraging teachers to make sure that they're doing videos uh, in their lessons so that the delivery is not just um, words on a screen, but also their teacher teaching and providing insight into the lesson. Um, I do have teachers who are talking about how they can have their Google Meet open while they're instructing. That is not a requirement of teachers and it is very difficult to do, um, but I do have teachers who are, are looking at how they can include uh, virtual learning students during those 4.5 hours in the morning, especially for some of the middle school social emotional needs that um, 
our 11 to 13, 14 year olds have and which the pandemic has been really hard on for that very reason. Uh, same at Ames. They're a little tricky here with the K-8 um, because our special, some of our specialists, for example, music and and uh, PE teachers, we share with the elementary, uh, but we're able to pull this off because um, we're doing some innovative scheduling. For example, we're going to switch around second hour with fifth hour in middle school to make sure that our, our uh, students can have the same teachers here in person. Thank you. So the next one, we have another Facebook question from a Sonia Helmi. What about band, wind, brass instruments in particular? So good evening, thank you for the question. Um, uh, about six weeks ago, our um, program manager for music across the district came to me and said, hey, if we ever end up in person, we're gonna need these. And, when she, and I had no idea what these were, but basically they're masks for your instrument and they have a little bit of elastic around the edge and it goes over the bell of a um, trombone or trumpet or uh, clarinet. And then there's even uh, uh, a mask for the flute. And so we have, we have used our um, ESSER funding to uh, get masks for all of the instruments. And then in the governor's safe learning plan, um, it also lays out that in music classes, we're, we're to mitigate um, spacing and have at least six feet between each student when they're playing their, their instrument with a mask on. So, and the instrument has the mask, not the student. Um, and then when, when they're not playing the instrument, the student would have the mask on. So it's a, it's a, we're, we're gonna test this out. All of the items are available and um, I see Principal Vibar and I'd love to hear from the field. And those boxes of instrument masks have arrived. I happened to open one by accident and I'm like, what are these? Um, but our uh, band instructor at Ramsey is super stoked and just regarding the spacing, if you think back to most band, orchestra, music rooms, they're one of the larger rooms in the building. So we are very confident that our um, orchestra and band and uh, will be able to gather and actually play together instead of playing um, primarily virtually as they have thus far. So the masks for the instruments have arrived and instructors are exploring how to make the best use of them. Thank you. Appreciate those answers. <clears throat> so uh, next question um, is from actually a, a Ms. Rita Goodrich. Why can't students wait to return to school until vulnerable family members are vaccinated? It's difficult to know over 30 days out where vaccinations will be once school starts. Rita, thanks for the question. We know this is a difficult uh, decision to make uh, for some families and I appreciate the question. We are uh, appreciative of the recent message from the state and the governor around the increased uh, availability of vaccines for family members uh, and and uh, our citizens in St. Paul, or uh, sorry, in the state of Minnesota. So we're really hoping that that information is helping to guide families and what might be available uh, by April 14th. But it, again, with the complexities of uh, setting up the secondary schools and making sure that those classroom uh, classrooms are set up appropriately for the number of students as we talked about with music or whatever the class might be. We want to make sure kids can be spaced out and uh, uh, we can be ready to receive our students on day one of in-person learning. We had to have the deadline of March 11th there. Again, families can choose to move to virtual learning at any time throughout the rest of the year, but we will not be able to move students into in-person uh, after the March 11th date. Thank you, Mr. Ott. Uh, another question uh, from Facebook. Uh, this question is from uh, Jessica Trevino. Will students that choose the virtual learning be included with the class while it's being taught live so they are on the same page? Um, thank you for the question. Um, it is not going to be required <laughs> that teachers have um, students in front of them and virtual students joining them during the day. It is, it's available for teachers to use. 
and at the uh, in creating one lesson plan for for both groups, they will have availability to the same material and to the same and to and to some instruction. And then because the day is shortened for the in-person students, there will be time for the virtual learning students to, to get access to their teachers for questions and for um, reteaching or things that they didn't understand. And it's not ideal, but I know that there are teachers who are planning to try it as uh, Principal Vibar um, shared with us. And um, we're all, we also have the ability for um, students to reach out and um, and and spend time asking questions of their teacher so that they know what they've what they are going to need to talk about when they get to that that portion of the day. The Schoology system allows for students to ask questions or give feedback to the teacher on how how things are going for them and what they understand and what they don't understand. And so it's it's this balance of when am I going to get my just in time instruction and some students will get it um, in person and other students will get it virtually at, uh, towards the end of the day. All right, another Facebook question uh, from Sarah Elfala. And she basically asks if she chooses to stay virtual, will she be able to do uh, to be a, an in person graduation? Hi Sarah, this is uh, Josh uh, answering the question for you regarding uh, graduation. At the present moment, both for in-person and virtual learners, right now we have not received any guidance yet and we are awaiting guidance in terms of how graduation um, will, will look and, and what the guidance is there. But what we can share with you is that when we receive that information, we will get it out to all of our families, both virtually as well as in person. Next question, for the students who play sports, if the new in-person schedule is from 8.30 to 1, will practice still be at 3 or will, or will it start right after the school day ends? Or is that depending on the school? That is a great question. Uh, uh, me again, Josh, uh, I have a wonderful opportunity of overseeing and working very closely with athletics. What I can share with you right now um, is that our sites, uh, based upon their schedules and our athletic directors are well aware of our plans for in-person. And of course, we want to make sure that all of our students, whether in-person or virtual, our student athletes are supported to make sure that they're present for practice or whether that's heading out for a game. So uh, through site to site, they'll work that out with the ADs, but making sure that our student athletes are given that opportunity to be there uh, based, on, uh, based on the learning model that they've chosen for, for them. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question is from uh, Peter Hendricks. For families and secondary students who wanna return, is there a reason why students are not able to return for full days and five days a week. Minneapolis appears to be allowing their secondary students to return for full days, five days a week. Yeah, Mr. Hendricks, uh, thank you for the question. Um, going back to the initial uh, overview and introduction I provided regarding our in-person opportunities, um, what we know is that many uh, districts across the metro have opted for four days. Uh, many of those districts opted for those four days because they recognize the necessary timing of planning, um, also the opportunity to keep and maintain the continuity of schedules with students, uh, recognizing the the um, impact that it would have in terms of schedule changes, in terms of teacher movements, um, and those pieces of data that are impactful uh, for students. And we, again, uh, in St. Paul, selected our opportunity to stay with those four days um, for, the, for wanting to make sure that we can maintain uh, the, the, the best continuity for our learners and maintain those relationships with our teachers. So thank you for the question. All right, next Facebook question from uh, Amani El Arabi. How will all EL families be effectively communicated with about changes in the schedule? 
I appreciate that uh, question. One of the uh, intentional focuses that we have been uh, working very closely with our communications department along with our uh, site leaders is uh, making sure that we are intentional about communicating to our EL families. So all of our translations and information that is coming out is in uh, a number of languages to help and support that. We also, as early mentioned, talk about all of the different uh, messaging that we are doing. We are trying uh, to ensure that we are being very communicative to all the different uh, languages that we can to uh, identify um, information and support you all with our, our plans of moving in person. In addition to that, we also have, as mentioned earlier, forums such as this. We will also have those site uh, informations that are going out to um, communities that are led by our principals. And with that, um, I just want to quickly uh, give our principals uh, a quick opportunity to just talk about how are you guys uh, reaching some of the EL families? And I know uh, Dr. Brown and Principal Vibar, you guys are doing a remarkable job with that. If you want to share really quickly. Um, I have leaned into the district communications office and utilized the uh, presentations in the languages that are available to us. Uh, using the uh, robo system, the connect ed to push these out. Um, I do have a couple of staff who work uh, at Ramsey that are supporting me with some of those specialized cases. Um, but I'm grateful that St. Paul has such a hardworking team of uh, communication <laughs> experts with all of the different languages that um, of the families we service. Same at Ames. Um, we're blessed here at this building to have two remarkable interpreters here on site and uh, they know our families very well. And so by the time I give them uh, a document to translate, uh, they already come back with some questions and can help refine it for our families and help me tweak the message before it even goes out. So um, we do that with, um, with Hmong and Spanish here at Ames are the primary languages we have at the building. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question from uh, Kim Nichols. Was there any consideration of a hybrid model? And what will the procedure be for a COVID outbreak, for example, in a classroom or other area of the school? Ms. Langworthy, I'll, do you want to start with the outbreak and then I'll uh, talk about the hybrid? Sounds great. Um, so we always start with the first step of making sure that we're identifying and isolating the person that is either sick or tested positive. Um, from there, we work to identify close contacts that might need to be quarantined. That might be an individual, that might be a classroom quarantine, it might be a temporary shift to distance learning for an entire grade band if we have multiple classes that are affected um, or multiple classrooms that are affected. Um, and then potentially an entire site. So we do look at that data regularly. I review that throughout the day, every day right now. Um, we, we look at the number of cases that may be in a particular building to look at making decisions. We also consult with the Minnesota Department of Health as needed and kind of lean into their expertise and their guideline recommendations. And then over to the uh, hybrid question. Um, yes, we did uh, consider the hybrid. One of the things uh, for those that uh, may be familiar with hybrid, um, you oftentimes end up cohorting students and that gives them a uh, possibility of two, two days on site. Um, and so if I was a student, it could be, I would be there Monday, Tuesday, and I wouldn't be back until that the next Tuesday. Uh, with our um, in-person model, it allows our in-person students to uh, maintain a consistency of being on site four days a week, um, getting that, that teacher connection. In addition to that, as mentioned, I know I keep saying it, but is really maintaining that continuity of schedule, uh, maintaining that continuity with their site and maintaining that continuity with teacher and most importantly, um, maintaining those relationships that they've developed. And when we uh, heard the voices of students and also with parents regarding uh, concerns about shifting and moving out from their teachers and everything that they've developed, um, the hybrid model is not the model we selected and, and that is why we went with our our in-person model of providing um, the opportunities that we have in uh, St. Paul for our students with in-person. Great question. Thank you. Next question from a Carla Lowerman Cummings. 
The local private schools and surrounding suburban districts are offering distance learning with students synchronously. So the teachers teach both in-person and distance, distance learners can listen in. Why is St. Paul Public Schools not doing the same? So we have found that our uh, method for um, getting students to come to school via distance learning has required us to have an asynchronous, primarily um, asynchronous or any time kind of a schedule. Um, and so more students are available to engage when they have more opportunities throughout the day to engage when they haven't been bused to the school and bused from the school. And so um, they have more opportunity in accessing the lessons at a time that works for them, whether they're caring for younger children, working or doing other activities for the family. And so students get a little bit more ability to um, get to their student work and they also get a little, uh, little bit of flexibility in their schedule when they are in distance learning and it's anytime learning. Um, a lot of the lessons that have been learned and folks are also offering in some spaces the availability of some synchronous times with with their classes maybe at the beginning of class or when they're going to have um, uh, a time when they're doing their um, foundations class or a, a class where they're where they're working together to to bring around um, the idea that they're they're having um, So if it's a social emotional portion of the day where they can offer that that synchronous time or same time event for students who are at home and at school. However, having the classes be the teacher create one lesson that works for kids who are at home and works for kids at school is the best way to accomplish this without asking them to do two jobs and accomplish and do two things. Um, and it, it also offers flexibility for the students who are in distance learning. So in short, it's just it's purely about flexibility for those uh, students who have family obligations at home, uh, given uh, the unprecedented situation that we're dealing with uh, with the virus, um, and, but also uh, uh, not just flexibility for them, but also being more helpful to staff delivering curriculum, correct? It, it, it is. It's both. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question is from a T Smith. Is the district supporting teachers with the technology to allow them to connect with students virtually, such as a Google Meet, cameras, etc., or is the weight of this completely on the teacher to navigate? Thank you for the question. Appreciate that. Uh, we have been fortunate here in St. Paul Public Schools to uh, have a personalized learning through technology referendum that the that we are able to support our students and staff to engage digitally with our students. And so along the way, teachers have had a laptop, a MacBook with a, with a camera and uh, an iPad as well, so they can replicate and simulate things that their students are doing on their iPads. So the teachers have both of those devices. We subscribe to Google Enterprise Services, so teachers not only have Google Meet, but they have the full suite of Google Meet uh, tools, which include breakout rooms and other uh, features within the Google Meet environment. Teachers also have access to their learning management systems, in the case of secondary here, Schoology, and a variety of applications that students can have on their iPads or they can uh, have deployed out. And there are subscriptions and things like that that also support student learning. So there are a variety of tools and resources within the classroom as well. We've uh, Many of our classrooms are now being upgraded with uh, over our facilities master plan to have integrated audio systems to help support uh, audio and then integrated projection systems uh, and projectors have been part of our instruction for a long time. So those tools and resources continue to be provided as best as we can to help the teachers connect with the students uh, both virtually and in person through our digital work. All right, thank you. So we have time for one more question here. This question is from a Lynn Duma. Will the grading structure return to the usual A through D for the fourth quarter, or with the modified structure, or, <clears throat> or with the modified structure, P for any passing grade uh, less than a B remain? 
It's a great question. We will be remaining in the modified grading practices for the rest of the year. So students earning an A plus to a B minus would get their letter grade. Students getting a C plus to a D minus would get a P. And then students who do not successfully pass their course would receive an NP. Um, important to note that the NP, a non-passing grade, is not affecting students' GPAs. They'll need to recover that credit and the learning that goes along with that, um, but it doesn't adversely affect them. And the last piece I wanted to add with that is this is um, aligned with what some local colleges and colleges nationwide are doing. The University of Minnesota is allowing um, passing um, grades that are um, GPA neutral. And for our student athletes and families with student athletes who are concerned about um, does, is this going to affect NCAA eligibility? Um, the NCAA um, Clearinghouse um, is actually allowing this to only positively affect a student standing academically. It would not negatively affect them by getting a P or a pass on their transcript. All right, thank you. Um, so that's all the time that we have for questions here this evening. I'm going to pass it over to Superintendent Gothard to finish off. Um, as has been customary, if you have questions that you'll put in the chat that were not able to be answered, typically those will be put up on the St. Paul Public Schools website uh, with the, those questions and the answers. So if you have entered a question in the chat and it was not able to get answered, please in the coming days, go to the St. Paul Public Schools website and look for your questions and answers there. Thank you, Mr. Moore, and, and, and thank you for the reminder. And, and please know that um, there's many good questions that are that are still left unanswered, and, and we will work as quickly as we can to get those out there. Um, some some incredibly important ones, and I can tell, uh, you know, being an SPPS parent myself, uh, clearly this is impacting each of you differently in terms of the support that you uh, want and, and uh, what you desire for, for your student and uh, in St. Paul Public Schools. And please know that uh, that we take that seriously and we really want to try to be there uh, for each individual and that's truthfully what's made this an incredibly challenging uh, year for us um, in making sure that decisions we make are impacting our students in a way that all can be successful and that looks different for each one of our students and our families and our staff in balancing uh, what the right decisions are for all of our, our students and our staff and our families and making sure that we can um, uh, that we can accomplish what we tell you that we're going to. And I, I think it's important that I share and I go back. I, I referenced earlier tonight, Executive Order 2082 back on July 30th. That's where the safe learning plan uh, was first um, originated and, and delivered to us. At the time, the learning model recommendations in there, again, it was zero through 10, uh, 10 through 20, uh, between uh, 20 and, and 30, over 30 to 50, uh, and, it, and there were various ranges in there for the learning model that it recommended from full distance to hybrid uh, to in-person. And it was a little bit different for secondary and elementary. Um, but the first number that we got was 23. Uh, that was back in uh, early August when we, we first got the plan. And, and again, we'll get another data uh, drop tomorrow uh, uh, for the, the Thursday Minnesota Department of Health uh, data for Ramsey County. At the time we were again, trying to have all of these decisions, unsure of what staff would be available, uh, what students would be here in terms of enrollment, and making sure that we could have the precision necessary to develop bus routes, routines, and lunchrooms to get students in the right places, to make sure we have the right staff hired, uh, to uh, cover all the uh, duties in all of our buildings, and did not feel at the time that we would have, that I would have the data to be confident in saying we are ready to start in anything but distance learning. And that was a hard decision. I took a, a, a lot of opposition from that decision. Um, I, I, I truthfully did uh, from, from families, uh, from staff, from community members. And uh, with that, then had to right away create what is distance learning going to look like? Because it has to be better than it was in the spring. We know that that was a, an emergency order. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time to prepare and plan and really wanted to work to do that. And while doing that, also create an opportunity for us to uh, go into hybrid learning, uh, you know, sometime after the start of the school year. And that was our plan. And I won't go over the entire thing because, you know, we did get one stage in. Uh, we had a delay uh, with some of the equipment that we uh, that we purchased. And, and by the time um, the end of October hit, uh, we were in that pre-holiday uh, surge in cases. So remember I referenced 23. That was our case number per uh, 10,000 residents in Ramsey County. 
Uh, by December 3rd, we were at 133. So we were far beyond uh, more than double uh, the safe rate for uh, being anything but distance learning. 50 was that that cutoff, and that was all districts in, uh, in the metro at least. I can't speak for the entire state. We made the decision on December 17th, we were going to return to elementary in person. And we did so saying that it, we're going to make the decision now for six and eight weeks out. At the time, the case rate was 106. So it was still pretty high, but we had reason to believe that there was going to be um, a, a great ability with uh, some of the governor's activities, uh, really um, asking people to, to isolate and to, and to physically distance that we could truly uh, see the case rates go down. And they did, and they have. And I'm so thankful for that because by the time we opened February 1st, uh, for our, our first uh, load of in-person students at the elementary, we we're at 35.5. Again, a pretty high number. Some of you may remember in our return to hybrid staging, we used 30 as our cutoff. That was our magic number at the time. Um, and you remember we were right at 27 to 30, uh, kind of in that range when we were uh, bringing back our stage one and contemplating bringing back stage two. So we get through the, the holiday break vaccines begin. I understand it was a lot to roll out at the very beginning and I want to fault nobody for that. I mean, there was a great deal of what I've, I've seen called vaccine envy. Uh, people wanted it because it was here and it was ready. And I want you to know that our, our team here in St. Paul Public Schools was truly ready for it. Uh, we, we really were. Uh, but quite honestly, we had more uh, demand than we did supply. And that was theme for many different organizations, individuals and communities you know, back in uh, the end of January into the beginning of February. We're in a different place now, so I don't want to talk about, you know, vaccines anymore. But I do want to share with you that our number last week was 15. Uh, and that's our, again, our case rate per 10,000 in Ramsey County. That's the lowest number that we've had since October 1st. And if we are going to be able to continue uh, experiencing this kind of trend, um, you, you know, that number is very close to what the Safe Learning Plan would recommend as an in-person model, under 10 for secondary students um, is uh, recommend, the recommended learning model is, is in person. So I, I want to share with you that we're making this decision. I'm making this decision based on uh, the knowledge of where our cases have been, where they are. Uh, that doesn't mean that we let our guard down. That doesn't mean that we don't practice proper masking. That doesn't mean that we don't distance where we can to the best of our abilities. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to continue to be vigilant in our reporting in our contact tracing and are making sure that we understand uh, what the impact of, of COVID cases or suspected cases has on our classrooms and our schools. Uh, we want everyone to be safe and we also want to demonstrate that we can reintroduce in-person learning to our secondary students. And at the same time, and I think you heard our staff tonight talk about how we can evolve and what virtual learning looks like when it's kind of in that in-between. You know, it's not full distance. Um, but you're not quite comfortable to be in person, and yet we want our secondary students to stay with their same teachers. Um, I would love to create, you know, different virtual environments with teachers, but that would that would essentially be doubling our staff in uh, some areas that are very hard to, to find teachers. Um, you know, you get into some of the single courses that we offer, there might be one teacher uh, in a building who teaches uh, that class, and for us to offer that mirrored experience, um, you know, we would have to replicate our schedule. We'd have to double it. Uh, so we thought it was very important for us to maintain, as Dr. Delich mentioned, the continuity of, of teacher. And with that, it may not be perfect, but I can share this with you. We will continue to gather feedback. Uh, we will continue to, uh, to work to make sure that it isn't just meeting the students' needs, that our students are able to thrive and find uh, that they can be successful in whatever environment that they choose. That's my commitment to you. And, and again, I can't say to you it's going to be perfect on day one in terms of the expectations that you have, but I can say that you have a committed group of, of leaders, you have a committed group of, of building leaders, and you have a committed group of educators and support staff who really wanna make this work for us. It has been a hard year. It has been an absolutely hard year. We haven't been in school since March 5th uh, was the last day of 2020 uh, that the full district was back uh, in a building. Um, our staff and our community have been through a lot together. It continues to be a real challenge. And while I want to say that there's hope on the horizon, um, I also want to say that there's hard work to be done. And I do not want to salvage this school year for anyone. I really want all of our students uh, to feel like they're getting the support that they need. 
Uh, we'll continue to get guidance on some of the activities that I know you look forward to. I've heard from many of you about um, from athletics to, to proms and to graduations and things of that nature. And we really want to close out our school year in the most positive way possible. And I can share with you that I can't do it alone. I can't tell people what to do or what model it is going to be and not have each of them have a personal responsibility with that. And as Mr. Moore talked earlier as well, uh, it's great that our case rate is low, but that can change on a dime if uh, if people let their guard down and if we're not practicing uh, the, the safe protocols and, and safe uh, um, standards that we've now been um, under for, for more than a year. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all uh, to, to our families. I know that this has been incredibly difficult. Uh, you're making choices about uh, education at a time in the in in the, both in the school year and in uh, where your uh, individual or students are at. And I know it can be extremely difficult. Please know that I uh, respect the uh, questions that you have, the the concerns that you have, and our team is committed to working together as hard as we can. Uh, to again make sure that we can ensure that our students are having a successful experience as we truly close out the school year and, and hopefully can remain safely in person learning and supporting virtual learning if that's the choice that you make. Uh, so again on behalf of our Board of Education, uh, on behalf of um, our staff and our community, I want to thank you and uh, appreciate you joining us for tonight's uh, uh, Family Forum.